1973, and I have never coached professionally. So if that is the, the deal breaker for any of you, feel free to, to get up and wander over to, to do the real football coach talking. <laughs> what I have done, on the other hand, is coach club football overseas since 1988. So I have been the guy who turns up to practice and seen 25 eager faces and no other form of coaching and tried to recruit one or two assistants during the season and failed and ended up being the guy by the end of the season. So the lack of resources, the lack of money, the lack of sponsorship, the lack of facilities, I feel your pain. I've seen it in a number of different countries. I've been able to consult with football coaches from basically all over the world, even when I haven't been able to devote the time to coaching. I spent 26 years of my life as an American Foreign Service officer, so when I started coaching club football overseas, it was in Melbourne, Australia, at Monash University, and that was the 28 guys and you know, no other coaches. I was told I was going to be helping out with the offensive line, and I did. <laughs> along with one or two other minor points. Um, but, but that's just, you know, what you, you can either panic and run home at that point or you can suck it up and, and coach a football team. And that's fortunately what I was able to do. Um, I've had other opportunities in other countries along the way. And I've also been privy to a body of knowledge that has shaped my thinking, not just about football, but about strategy and conflict in general. And what I've ended up sort of pointing toward is, is more of a synthesis of conflict, including this conflict simulation we call American football. And yes, I do compare it to a board game, because essentially, to me, that's what it is. And that, that bothers a lot of people very deeply. And I don't mean in any way to denigrate anyone in uniform who goes and, and sacrifices a limb or an eye or their life for their country. And I'm not comparing them to some kid's game with helmets and shoulder pads. Exactly the opposite, in fact. What I'm saying is that there is a strategic continuum which includes the battlefield mission and also includes training. And to my mind, and to the minds of a number of very convincing authorities for many decades now, one of the best strategic simulations available is American football. Because everything you do is being opposed by a cognizant, aware force that is trying to dog your every step and undo everything you're attempting to do all the time, from the start of the game to the finish. And to me, that's the definition of a war game. Now, you know, when we're lucky, we get out of this without injuries, and certainly we don't want to see any deaths on a football field at any time ever, practice or game. And so the actual physical, you know, relationship one-to-one -one between American football practice and playing on the one hand, and war, on the other hand, doesn't exist. But training for war, in many ways, in small units at least, looks a lot like training for football. And there's a reason for this, and it's that interior logic which has drawn me further and further into the game over the years. And that's going to form sort of the unspoken thesis of this talk about theory. And then this afternoon, when I try and keep five people awake after lunch, um, it's going to inform an offensive talk about practice, two different offenses, both of which encompass speed and power and deception into their fundamental design. Because to my mind, if you can't design something from the ground up, it's probably not worth building. I know <coughs> Coach Saunders is talking in the next session about designing an effective offense. I'm, I'm going to sit in on that one as well. I'm, I'm sure I can learn quite a bit. I've never stopped learning about the game, and I hope never to stop learning. Uh, or else I'll have stopped reading by that point. Um, but to kick things off, I'll walk us through the, the PowerPoint here. And I do want to keep things in perspective, which is that no matter what you accomplish with your life, this picture will always be more awesome. Just keep that in mind. Of course, back when Ron's Oak was in Illinois, that was about the only thing that was awesome. <laughs> Every senior football requires some kind of <coughs> speed, power, and what will be most of the point of this talk, deception. All phases of the game we're talking about here. It, it would seem to apply most obviously on offense, and that's where I'll start off. And I'll start off by defining what we mean by deception. And this comes from 
uh, a military source. Actually, it's cyber warfare that first developed the two types of deception as a, a theoretical breakdown. The first kind is ambiguity increasing, or A type deception. And the second type is misleading or misdirecting, or M type. Now, I tried a little thought experiment um, a couple of days ago. I went on Google and I typed in uh, misdirection in American football. And I got wing T, and I got other sort of series based offensive stuff, and a little bit of trick plays, and a little bit of triple reverse flea flickers, and, you know, a, a mishmash, but generally speaking, the topic was actually American football. When I typed in deception in American football, I got the New England Patriots. <laughs> Two pages of the New England Patriots. They've ruined this concept for life. Okay, A type deception confuses the adversary so he is unsure of what to believe, resulting in utter confusion. And this means you give the opponent, the adversary, options, and you make them guess which option you're actually planning on fulfilling. Now in football, we have not only the old classic option schemes, the split back beer, the wishbone, flex bone, but these days you've also got zone read, you've got the run pass options, which are making so much um, noise these days on Coach Huey and other boards over in the States. And more to the point, the passing game in particular is an option in that you're trying to isolate two receivers on one defender or three receivers on two defenders. You work to create those situations in the modern passing game, and that's option football as well. Because you've got to keep them guessing about your intent. And that doesn't just have to be with, you know, riding the full back and then optioning the end man on the line of scrimmage. It's also the air raid. That's pure option football in its own way. So, run schemes, which are A-type. Ambiguity is being increased here. The classic example, again, is the wishbone triple. Now, I'm not really fond of the diagramming here, and I'm sorry I don't have a laser pointer with me, because to my mind, the classic triple against uh, an Oki look, against uh, a 3-4 or 5-2 front, would involve bringing the guard and the center down on that nose man to either get movement or else come off to the next level so that you're sealing the inside effectively one way or the other. So having done that, you need someone specifically to tackle here down on the strong inside linebacker. And now that defensive tackle is your read. And the quarterback steps back, the ball goes into the gut of the fullback, and his eyes are on that read. And as the fullback moves forward, the ball moves forward, the feet don't necessarily move forward at that point because you want stability in the read exchange. If he does anything other than attack the ball, it's a give read. So this is an option right here in itself, which is why we call this triple option football. If the read does anything other than attack the fullback, assuming he's getting the fullback in, the football inside, anything other than that, it's a give to the fullback. If he sits, if he skates, you know, if he backs up, if he slants outside, um, you know, if you get anything other than attack right now, the fullback's getting the football. And he's got strong blocking to the inside of him. He's got people holding on the outside of him, waiting to see if the ball goes outside. And you've got a beautiful crease right up the middle of the defense. Now, assuming the read does as he's trained, and he attacks the fullback, then he just, the quarterback disengages, comes down the line, and now he's optioning that end man on the line of scrimmage and the rest of it you're familiar with. But I wanted to make that point about the first read in the, the wishbone triple option because that is as much a read option as anything you'll see out of the spread shotgun these days. And here we have the zone read. And we've all seen this. You've got a choice between inside zone or the quarterback keep based entirely on the actions of that one defender. And the move and counter move continues. Um, this was what it looked like actually about five or six years ago. But now you'll see the end coming hard inside. You'll get this guy scooting right off his tail, hoping that this will engender a quarterback keep read, and then you clobber him before he reaches the line of scrimmage. And now there's offensive adjustments to that, and the game goes on. Back and forth, back and forth. Um, you know, the, the last guy with a chalk wins. 
That's, that's the way the strategic exchange in football is always going to go. Now there's also ambiguity in the air. Does anyone know who those two guys are? Yeah. Norm Chow. And Norm Chow. Correct. Um, I could just as easily have put Doug Scoville, Lavelle Edwards, and more to the point, Sid Gilman, if I wanted to talk about the real origins of the air raid offense, the passing game. Um, it all goes back to Sid Gilman. And through Sid Gilman, it actually goes back to a guy at Ohio State back in the 1920s, but that's a completely different lecture. Here we have an air raid classic, the shallow cross. You're sending that Y end quite literally on the heels of the defensive line. I mean, when we say shallow, we mean shallow. And then you've got a 10 yard sort of, um, you've got a vertical stem, you've got an outside release by the H-back. They call it a hunt route because you've got to hunt for the space in zone coverage where you can settle down and show his numbers to the quarterback and hopefully get the football for a 10 yard game. Against man coverage, he's just going to keep going. He turns it into a dig route and he tries to outrun his defender and get himself open that way. And then you've got an outlet down low, the fullback is swinging out to the right hand side. And hopefully the clear outs, the fades by X and, y and Z there will have left room for the fullback to be a useful dump off if you can't get anything going with Y or H. So, option football. If you've got a short defender to the weak side there, he's in a bad situation. You're running off the deep coverage. You're spreading things horizontally as well. You're making it very difficult for one inside short defender to cover both H and Y. And that is the essence of the option. Mike Leach, Washington State Cougars. You start off with what is a classic against cover two, which is the smash root, which is X um, pitching down low, maybe five, six, no more than say seven yards. Um, and again, showing his numbers to the quarterback. Meanwhile, Zed there is downfield and he's over the top uh, outside. He's running the corner route, what we used to call the flag. But here, there is an adjustment, the hitch and post, where X is reading what's going on. So the first option that we see is we've got this movement here by H, which is going to draw attention from the defense. Because you've lined up with a sort of a nasty split to this surface, you have brought the safety down to help with the run defense. The nickel is now doing his best to defend this threat, especially with a back away and one who's likely to head over in this direction to the field. I would actually diagram this with uh, the ball on the left hash to show you know, because you can certainly run smash and, and this package um, from the left hash very usefully. The compression isn't going to hurt what you're doing in the passing game, and the threat of the run becomes more credible when you've got wide field to run to. But you've got the defense to pre-commit to this right here, which means, again, we have an underneath defender on the inside who is in a world of pain. Because essentially, no matter what he does, he's wrong. He has to respect that threat of the fake, um, you know, the run to the field side, the run from the middle of the field even, is something that Will has got to look for cutback on. Has to, has to, has to look for cutback here. And even two steps in that direction is going to mean that when X notices this, because when he's hitched, he can not only see the quarterback, he can also see the weak linebacker. Now he's taken off the post and having delayed Defensive recognition delayed the pass rush quite likely um, by faking the run to the nasty slot side. You've got time for the quarterback then to throw the play action post. And if the free safety cooperates by widening, by expanding outside with that corner route by Zed, then You've got all kinds of space here in the deep middle, and that's bad for defenses generally. So this is also a couple of layers of option football. You know, you're, you're not only picking on this poor Will linebacker with a run threat here and a pass threat there, um, but you're doing it in a way that's got 
all of this potential help basically out of position before the ball has even snapped. So design matters. Putting a little thought into how you package these things makes a great deal of difference sometimes. Back to M-type deception. Now we're misleading, we're misdirecting. It builds up the attractiveness of the wrong alternative. And the result is convinced misdirection. Um, and here, we're looking back to the very early days of football because, quite frankly, this starts with the single wing, which was born in 1906. And deception from the single wing starts around 1918, 1919, um, run pass options, full spins by full backs, buck lateral series, all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, because someone realized that just smashing mouth off tackle is not going to work forever. And when you've got an offense which is invented in 1906 and it's now 1919, people have had some time to catch up. So what do you do? You innovate. And how do you innovate? You misdirect. Now, before I go any further, whether you have any interest in the single wing offense or not, you must own this book, Winning Single Wing Football by Dr. Kenneth Kerfel, K-E-U-F-F-E-L. It is the single best, best offensive football text I've ever read, and I've read a lot of them. He covers every aspect of what it takes to coach a winning offensive program. He goes into um, every single thing that you can think of, uh, coaching, scouting, every <coughs> part of it in, in single chapters. The man was an English literature major from the University of Pennsylvania, an Ivy League school. He played single wing football at Princeton. Uh, he was a giant among American football coaches, coaching in a private <coughs> high school in New Jersey until very close to his death in the early 2000s. Uh, and this was someone who was playing single wing football in the early 1950s. So, you should be able to locate this, Google it. Um, it should be, in fact, they still got a website being run by his widow that sells it for a reasonable price. Um, and the US dollar is still fairly weak, so exploit it. Um, you know, when you get a currency exchange like that, Raven Village, there's no two ways about that. It'll turn against you someday and you'll be gritting your teeth. So, you know, when things are cheap, invest in them. Um, and I want to digress for one second because I was taking the lovely scenic train up from Euston Station in London. And I'm going through Modern Strategy by Colin Gray, which was written right about the turn of the century. And he's talking about the different dimensions of strategy here. And I just happened to cross this, not even realizing that it was going to sort of dovetail with what we're talking about here. But under a chapter heading called Information and Intelligence, Professor Gray, who I think has just retired from the University of Reading, says, Sun Tzu advises warfare is the Tao, or way, of deception. Now, more usefully for our purposes, he also says, to deceive, one must first penetrate the cultural veil to comprehend an adversary's worldview so that one can feed his expectations. And that is the essence of M-type deception. Since people tend to believe what they want to believe, Deception requires an empathy with the adversary's expectations. So this is all about showing them something that they want to believe. Getting them to react to that and then hitting them someplace entirely different. So, single wing, and again, Dr. Kerfel's book is absolute gold. Um, the modern double wing that everyone hates, where you've got 11 guys in a phone booth and they run that awful toss play. It's mainly a misdirection offense. You know, they'll run that toss as much as you let them, but then they will misdirect, 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 and that's how they're going to score most of their points on you. Unless they're physically superior enough to grind you down in the second half and start running that toss play for 9, 10, 11, 15 yards at a crack in that can happen too. And then the wing T, which was actually a response by a couple of old single wing players from the University of Michigan, uh, Forrest Eveshevsky and Dave Nelson, um, they played for Fritz Chrysler at Michigan under the single wing. They won a national championship in 1948. And then they decided that since everyone in America was switching to under center, since everyone was going T formation, they were going to take everything they loved about single wing and they were going to put it in the wing T. And they were going to use the same kinds of M-type deception based on a play series, which is to say a core play, the main threat, 
the thing you really want to get good at and sting people with because it's an effective and it's a um, you know it's a gap sound it's a legitimate threat it's it's not a gimmick this is something that you can really run 20 30 times a game um, especially in club football and then you want to have every single response that the defense can possibly make to that core play and then you want to attack that response in a different manner that's how you build this series of N type deception plays and here we have in wing T the buck sweep this is not an outside sweep play this is a D-gap sweep. You're kicking out. You're not running wide. You're not going um, hash marks number sideline with the buck sweep from wing T, unless the defense really screws up. If they're doing their jobs, you're going to cut this one up in the D-gap. Um, and it starts with the threat of the quarterback faking the buck trap, the very quick trap up inside to the fullback. And you can actually block the trap play very, very, very close to how you block Buck Sweep. If you get a cooperative defense, which is to say a good defense that's good at reading, that starts flowing and it sees guards pulling, when it follows its keys, you can come right back inside, bring him up in here, and you can misdirect. You don't have to come down on that linebacker to make the block here. You can pull him out of the hole. You can even get the will linebacker to overrun the trap hole. If, you, if you're good at what you do, and if they're good at what they do. You're using good defensive flow. You're using intelligent reading. You're using active, angry linebackers against the defense when you choose to run buck trap off of the buck sweep threat and block it just like buck sweep, only you give him full back and off he goes. And it's one of the more painful feelings that a defensive coordinator can have. Now, meanwhile, the quarterback, having faked the fullback, handed to the halfback, is now booting away and threatening the waggle pass, which is one of the great, most dangerous run pass option plays in football. Um, if he keeps the ball on waggle, he's going to have one of the guards out in front of him as an escort, and the fullback will come through here and out into the flat quickly, and he's almost impossible to defend and stop for short of five or six yards. And you can throw that one all day long if you're running the buck sweep series. This is not a play, no. This is a series. It's only a useful threat as a series. So, let's say quarterback fakes fullback, hands uh, halfback, and then goes off and takes his waggle. The halfback is, is getting outside hard and fast, and he's got a couple of pulling guards, and he's got blocking with a bit of angle on it, so you've got a little bit of a mechanical advantage here, so you should get some movement here, you should get some movement here, Whoever the force player is, that first guard is going to kick out. The second guard is going to pull through for whoever's coming down on the play vertically. And if everyone does their job, you should make some decent yards. This is not a game-breaking play. It's not designed to be. But it is designed to be three, four, five, six, seven, eight yards a crack, especially late in the game. Um, as you sting them with the various counters to the buck sweep, the buck sweep just gets better and better. The more effective the trap is, uh, the more you know, you sort of burn them with a waggle and get them mad because they've been fooled again, the more effective the Bucks with is because they stop and they think when you start that sequence of actions and that's where you want them. If you're an offensive coordinator, you want to think you defense. <coughs> now, back to the single wing, the earlier version of the same general idea. Um, Evashevsky and Nelson, in, in their first great book about the wing T, which they wrote in 54, 55, something like that, said the full spin by the fullback in the single wing is the single best play series in football. It is the hardest to decipher. The ball is direct snap to the fullback. The fullback is stepping, turning, receiving the snap, turning his back to the line of scrimmage. The football disappears at that point. You might have a little quick motion by the wing back back behind him just coming back right underneath him so he can mesh with him, almost like years in a watch. And so he can fake getting the ball from the fullback, he can get the ball from the fullback. You've also got the tailback, you can come in the other direction, and you leave room sometimes for the wingback to come a little bit deeper when the tailback's actually getting the ball. And this provides you with um, a full spin trap play up the middle, a wingback reverse, a wingback reverse pass, which is especially effective from this formation if the wingback is left-handed. 
you can get the tailback off tackle, you can get the tailback out wide, and you can get the tailback running the optional running pass where he's heading out wide on the sweep, but he's got receivers downfield, none of the linemen have gone deeper than whatever's currently allowed. We'll talk about that with my best options in a minute, too. Now this is a further sort of extension of the full spin series by the fullback from single wing, in that he's getting the ball, he's handing to the tailback, he's now dropping back to pass. So you've got very intricate play action off of misdirection style football, but now we're going to have ambiguity style football option thrown in too, because you've got the strong end um, running a corner route, you've got the wing back releasing outside and then cutting back in across to have at least one and hopefully two or even three defenders think about are they going to throw back to the weak side. So preventing sort of general flow to the strong side, you, you send him back across the grain, and oh by the way, the weak side end crosses underneath him, which means the wing back scrapes off any tight man defender who's on the weak side end, legally. This is not a pick, because if your two players are rubbing shoulders with each other as they cross, you're not picking anyone. That's a rub. That's legal. If you're doing that with a defender, that's a pick. That's illegal. But if you design a play where your guys are passing within an inch of each other, there's no way you can maintain defensive leverage on both of those receivers. It's not physically possible, and it's completely legal. If someone gets caught up in the wash, you know, that's their fault. You're not setting out to pick anyone. You're rubbing off your own guy. And you can show the film to the officials. I mean, this, this is clean. This is plain vanilla football on how to get people open without picking anyone. They will get caught in the wash. There's no way they can maintain leverage on both of those guys. They can try switching, but I don't like their chances. So, deep threat off of the play action. So this is a slower developing play and don't have time to get up here. And if people are coming up because they see this full spin developing, then you've got a home run shot there. You've got him without any chance of having tight man coverage on him out here, you know, a second or so later. So it goes bing, bing in terms of the way it develops. And you swung your blocking back all the way out here wide, and so you've even got him to drop the ball off too. So this is actually a combination of M-type deception, because you're misdirecting them about what you're up to when that fullback starts spinning. And again, the second he turns his back to the defense, the ball's gone. And you can't tell what he's up to. And everything you do after that is designed to keep the defense guessing. A good pass. Um, Root package, it's useful in other formats as well, but I really like it from full spin. But it's not just offense where speed, power, and deception come into things. I want to show you some possibilities. And you realize that there is a presentation later this afternoon all about stealing time for special teams. What I am suggesting to you is that you choose your special teams schemes wisely. And do things that are sound, of course, but do things that are different so that your opponents are seeing plain vanilla punt, plain vanilla punt, plain vanilla punt, what the hell are these guys doing? And then they have to take extra time to prepare for you because you're not doing what everyone else is doing. It doesn't cost you any extra effort whatsoever to do what you're doing. Your scheme is no more intrinsically difficult to install than any other. It's just different. And if it's enough different and still sound, and there's a lot of different schemes that work, just because something's not in fashion in football doesn't mean it's obsolete necessarily. There's some things I would not choose to go out and run, but there's a lot of schemes that I've, I've heard of over the years that work just fine if you commit yourself to them and if they fit your talent and your inclination and your understanding. If you can get inside an offensive scheme that needs little quick guys and you've got lots of little quick guys, heaven's sake, I don't care if no one's ever seen it, you know, um, in Edinburgh. That makes it a lot more effective, in fact, if no one's ever seen it in Edinburgh. Now, if they've seen it every week that they play in Edinburgh, you're going to be in a little more trouble. You're actually going to have to have better talent than they do. But the idea of being contrary is not only that you can base things on deception a little more than most teams do. And the point here is that teams that have talent don't have to do this stuff. You know, if you are Alabama, 
you don't care if everyone knows every single detail of what you're doing on defense, you're still going to line up and pound them into a hole. Nine times out of ten. And that's usually enough to at least get you into the championship round. Some years, 11 times out of 11. But for the rest of us, for the up-and-comers, for the ones who aren't established, who don't have Hall of Fame coaches in the making, who can't recruit just by like waving a hanky that has a little crimson A on it, you know, if people who have to actually work to develop talent, they're the ones that have to worry about stuff like deception. And so you see teams that have not had success traditionally going to the air raid offense, for example, for that A tire deception. You see other teams working misdirection, M-type deception, into what they're doing from um, the spread. I mean, Urban Meyer knows single wing football. He's gone deep into the history books for his understanding of offensive football. When he had Tebow playing tailback for him at Florida, and I say tailback because that's not a quarterback, that's a single wing tailback. And that's exactly what, what Meyer was doing with him. His first introduction as a freshman into the Florida offense was in a special package, and that was pure single win. That was 1920 football. That was way before the time of most of the defensive coordinators that they had to face, and it still worked. There's nothing unsound about it just because no one's been doing it because it's been out of fashion. To a certain extent, gentlemen, we are lemmings. The trend comes along, we will follow it right over the cliff. We'll win some games, everyone else will win some games, Fashion will go out, people will catch up with a new scheme, and you know we'll, we'll revert back to the mean. We'll stop being geniuses until we find another new thing to do. Well, sometimes old things are worth doing too. And a lot of the old things on offense that we were just looking at were based on more misdirection than we see these days. It tends to be A-type deception in this day and age that we're seeing more of. It tends to be the zone read. It tends to be a little bit of the the run pass option, rather than single wing, double wing, wing two. But there are elements of misdirection, of M-type deception, which are being worked into offensive football by people like Herman Meyer. So, how do we do this on special teams? How do we make deception work for us in special teams? Which, as we're going to hear later this afternoon, have to have a few minutes here and there stolen physically away from offense and defense in, in most teams. Well, we can follow my advice and do things a little bit differently. So when a team lines up to receive the kick, you're going to show them something they've never seen before. I mean, if you've been doing it for three, four, five years, then you can guarantee they're going to have a lot of film on you because it's quite likely that no one else is still doing it the way you're doing because, again, we're not great at early adopting new ideas or even good old ideas in football. This is the ABC kickoff, and it basically involves having three kickers. Start groaning right now, who the hell has three kickers? You only have one kicker. This guy, B, is your kicker. What you do is you cull the talent pool, you know, people that can um, sort of walk and chew gum at the same time, run quickly, are reasonably agile, um, and, and that becomes your, your kickoff team, you want to find from among them who can master one skill. And there are two different one skills that you want two specific people to learn. And you have competitions and you make it fun. And you, in the process, you hone a system in which you have three potential kickers on your kickoff team, meaning you can unleash onside kicks at any moment without giving anything away. So B is your regular kicker, he's going to boot the ball. You know, and, and that's great, that's good stuff. I'll come back to B at the end because he can also do one other thing well. A has learned one specific technique. B starts toward the ball, A cuts in front of him, tops the ball so that it goes bounce, big bounce, and then up in the air towards this poor fellow, number five here, who's hiding behind the 50 yard marker. The ball has grounded. Fair catch doesn't do him any good. Okay, this is not a ball in the air. This ball has grounded itself off the kicker's foot. He is live meat. So we send two of these nice fellows, either R1 and R2 or R2 and R3, and we just drive him into the next county. Shoulder to shoulder, we just wipe the heck out of this poor guy. And the ball is coming to him slowly, and it's hanging. And so he's like, and then he's going to get driven into the next county. 
Harris County. And the third of them, let's say R1 and R2, plaster number five, R3 comes in behind, falls on the football after it's traveled the requisite 10 yards, first down, kickoff team. Teams will get in, you know, they'll, they'll get used to that and they'll start crowding people over here. No problem. C is a sidewinder kicker. This is sort of the classic onside kick where he's going to come in, B again will start to approach the ball, he'll sidewind it, and we want the ball to be right about here when it passes that, that 10 yard rule. Now again, we're number two. We're going to send two people after him, and we're going to bring two more in behind to make sure that one of them comes up with football. And again, if you do it properly, and it's not hard to do properly, first down kickoff team. And you can alternate these. You can use one early in the season if you think people are, are you know, really scouting you heavily. And still keep the other one hidden until you really need it later in the season. You can use them both. You can show them everything. You know, it's up to you. You can scare the heck out of them on the first, you know, you can, you can use three consecutive different onside kicks for your first three kickoffs of the season if you want to. Just to make sure someone's coming. Just, you know, just, you want the guy in the film room calling for his brown pants, basically. You, know, you really want that guy worried. That's, that's one philosophy. The other is to hold on to at least two of the three on-site options until you really need them. I don't really care. The fact is you've got the options and they have to respect them. Now B is also part of the fun because we can also do a different kind of kick by B where we will call a signal like B2. We'll, we'll give him some distinctive signal to the rest of the team that he's not going to kick deep. In fact, he's going to send a screaming line drive right at the midsection of number four, and we're going to play for the rebound. We're going to assume that whoever this guy is, and there's no reason to believe that the hands team is in at this point because he's your regular kicker. So if he approaches the ball, we can teach him how to kick reliably a line drive. And if four is stupid enough to get in front of it, it's going to bounce off of him. He's n there's no way I've seen someone control this reliably. The odds are way in your favor of it falling down. And this, in this, you know, you just converge the rest of the, the people other than B on number four and play for the rebound. And as long, you know, once it comes off him, it's traveled the necessary 10 yards. It's a live ball. You fall on it. It's your ball. That's three different onside kick possibilities from one kickoff scheme he is your kicker. You only have to work with him as a kicker. He only has to practice popping the ball. He only has to practice sidelining it. And they'll come in after practice and work on it themselves. This is pride. You know, I won the game by my, my special onside <coughs> kick, Mom. You know, I worked on it for hours and hours after practice. And look, I just won us the championship. Okay, that's dreaming a little bit, but you get the idea. Incentive. You don't even need to tell these guys. They'll be out there working on it. They'll be working on it at home. You're going to see one guy topping footballs, but you know, wherever he goes, he's going to be topping a football as he walks down the street. The other one will be sidewinding it. And you don't have to encourage him to do this. You instill pride in a special scheme that no one else is doing, and people buy into it. Even the guys that don't get to be one of A, B, or C, they buy into it too, because this is easy pickings. This is people falling on footballs on a regular basis and recovering them for the kickoff team, and that goes over well too. If I say anything that's violating the, the rules as you play it here, do please stick your hand up. That's not an insoluble problem. It takes a little bit of an adjustment. This is written for um, high school rules in the US for the 48 states that don't play NC2 mode. But it can be adjusted, and something like this can be adapted to the rules you have. There are ways to instill different options in anything, including a kickoff. Kickoff return. Buck lateral. The buck lateral was a single wing, and here we are back to Coach Kerfel, football series where someone gets the ball, runs forward with it, hands it to someone else who's turned around, and then they take off with it, or pass it, or pitch it to someone else, and hilarity ensues. 
We're going to do the same thing as a kickoff return. We're going to have these five players and these two players who are out here on the flanks block. We're going to area block. We're going to block, you know, we can assign them the inside three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And we're going to leave, you know, one, two in the safety unblocked because we're misdirecting with four people here in the backfield. You've got a player here, a player here, a player here, and your deep return receiver. Let's say that the ball goes deep down the middle and S fields it normally, and he starts forward. F is going to turn his back to the kickoff team. And these guys are going to come underneath. That, you know, as soon as the ball is kicked, they're going to head down this way, and they're going to pass right behind where F is. S, if he feels the ball deep, hands it to F and continues forward as though he might still have a football. Because you can have him fake to F and continue with the football. So that's one option. F can receive the ball from S, delay a count until these other two guys have passed in front of him and each fake receiving a handoff. And then he can spin in and head upfield as well. That's the second option. Either one of these can receive the handoff as well, and the other will fake. So one of these four guys has the football, the other three are faking like they've got the football, and they're going in widely different directions. You can have F sort of meander over here a little further away from where S was, and you're blocking the middle of the kickoff team, it's strong. You're taking everyone from number three to number nine here, and you're, you're blocking them. So, the point here is, even though you don't block the furthest outside players, it's entirely possible they're being faked out by these guys who have come around behind F and are pretending to have the football, or maybe they actually do have it. Is this violating any rules? Okay, just checking. Even if it did, it could be adapted, is my point. This takes a lot of practice, and it's sensitive to conditions, in the sense that if the ball doesn't go deep to S, you have to adapt. If the ball goes short, F is in charge. He makes different calls depending on where the, the ball is heading when it's kicked. He can call ace, jack, queen, king, you know, whatever signals you want to use to tell the other guys back there what's going on. And he can call off the whole thing. He can feel the ball himself if it's short, and he can yell out a signal meaning, you know, all the, the fancy hoo-ha is off just get the most yards you can, we're going to turn this into a way to return right up the middle because we're blocking strong in the middle. But the option to do it this misdirecting way is there when the kicker cooperates and gets the ball to this fellow who's deep in the center. There's also a chance, if you work on it, that the ball can come out here and you can still go through this whole sequence. I'm not too fussed about that. We'll just take advantage of anyone who's silly enough to kick the ball right down the middle deep. And that's, that's the main thread of this return. You'll, you'll stop people pretty, pretty quickly from kicking the ball down the middle deep as you run a return like this. And then you can switch back to something else. This doesn't take long to install. And no one else will be doing anything remotely like it. Have you? Did you? Yeah. Which Star Wars is a different variation of the same idea. There's all kinds of different things you can do, and they're out there. With this the age of the internet, Coach Huey, you know, everything is out there and accessible for the most part. And you usually don't have to pay to get good football information. If you're paying, I think you're missing the point. There's so many coaches out there who are happy to share. If you just dig, if you make enough of a pain of yourself and ask questions, my experience is you'll get answers. I've had stuff out on the internet on this and on the ABC kickoff for 14 years now, 15, 16 years. And I get people cropping up who ask me questions about it because my email address hasn't changed since then. Um, you know, every so often I'll get someone saying, well, what happens when they're, you know, don't worry about it. It works, don't worry. Okay, you're familiar with the rugby punt. Who here runs rugby punt, anyone? Okay, you are building this direction into the action of punting. You're kicking the side based on the way the defense lines up. 
you've got a scheme in place that allows you to block strong in front of your punter who is rolling out, as it were, and also threatening not just the line of scrimmage, but the first down line. And he's threatening in a way which means the, the threat of punting remains credible for the maximum time possible. So that's a dual threat. That's an option, if you will, on the defense that they have to respect. They can come up and try and tackle him, you know, in which case the ball may end up rolling sort of endlessly, which is what you want to see from a rugby punt. Or, you know, you may get a first down. And you're threatening that every time you run this. And there's, there's beautiful fakes and misdirection that you can do off this whole action. This is, this is gorgeous, the rugby, the rugby punt. It's one of my favorite schemes. And it's one of the ones that I would probably end up using on a fairly regular basis, but I would rotate. I wouldn't want to get sort of so set in my ways, given that there are about 20 different ways that you can line up and punt the ball usefully these days. You know, I would keep sort of switching every few seasons just to keep things fresh. That's maybe something you can view as a downside of this approach to football, of, of trying to deceive and misdirect. You don't want to do exactly the same thing year after year. You want to have twists. And this is twistable. I mean, there's sort of three or four layers in this direction that you can do off something like this. And again, if it's all you do for that season, if the rugby punt is your scheme for that year, it's not enough <coughs> more teaching. It's different. It's not maybe not what they learned last year, but you've got a new season, you've got the time in front of you. You know, you can make effective use of your, you know, 14 hours of training before the season starts or whatever it is. And you can install it just as easily as you can install what you were doing last year. Maybe you won't have quite as many guys saying, oh yeah, I remember that. But in, in a way, I like that. I like people being more engaged because it's something new. It keeps their interest longer, for one thing. You get fewer guys checking out when you install a new scheme. It's something that sort of helps build a team atmosphere when they know that you're concerned enough about their success on the field to be thinking in the offseason and to be looking at something new that they can win with. That validates players in a lot. Okay, now, how does this all relate, this whole business about misdirection, deception, um, on defense? And for the answer, I'll go to something called the two-level defense, which some of you may have heard of, which originated in Canada, of all places, as a result of the run-and-shoot, um, sort of, not a thing wrong with Canada. Um, they, they play fun. You get too many guys that feels too big. Um, more to the point, the almost unlimited motion possibilities make it real damn hard to defend when you're running something like run and shoot and you're trying to spread the field and get people into the creases and score. Also bigger field. It's a much bigger field. And that's a considerable advantage for the offense. And I don't really think having only three downs balances that advantage, but that's just me. Um, back to the 11 man version of our code. The essence of two-level football is that there's a first level of five defenders who may or may not be what we consider classic defensive linemen. The ends may be smaller and faster than we're usually used to calling defensive ends, but there are people, five people, that normally line up real close to the line of scrimmage. There's another sort of level of five who are not, strictly speaking, defensive backs or linebackers. Although, the ones on the outside will be more defensive back-ish. The ones in the middle will be more linebacker-ish most of the time. If they're up against, um, you know, two-back tight end in particular, you'll see usually three very linebacker-looking guys here and a couple of DBs out there. And then you've got something else completely different. You've got a player who's lined up 28 yards deep. And his job is to cut off the field vertically at 18 yards from sideline to sideline, not Canadian. Um, in Canadian, you use two years for the field. Um, and this shuts off the, it, it, they call it the end line concept. He enforces an end line and prevents the offense from, from moving the ball deeper than that with one throw. Because he's got the advantage of vision and momentum because he's looking forward at the offense the whole time. He's not running <coughs> up, he's running forward. Under control at first until he sees how the play develops. And then he's like a heat-seeking missile for the last part of his journey, which is to remove the football from the football carrier, whoever he may be. 
by one means or another, <coughs> usually kinetic energy. So two-level defense, basic idea, five more or less linemen, five second-level defenders, we call them, and then the deep safety. Now, if you see motion, if number one motions across the formation, he becomes the new number two here, he becomes number three, he becomes number two to the strong side, what used to be the strong side, he, can, he becomes number one. You'll bump these defenders to motion. No matter what coverage you have called, you will always bump to motion. So if he starts across the formation, L goes with him until he gets to number two, then L bumps S, and if number one keeps going across the formation, S bumps M, and if number one keeps going across the formation, M bumps W, and if he keeps going across the formation, W will come right out here with it. If he goes out wider than the original number one, then two will, um, W will bump to R, and R will end up out here because he's always on number one to this side. He's always on number one to this side. He's always on number two to this side. He's always on number two to this side. He's always on number three. No matter where they are in the field. This is the basic idea behind the two-level defense if you're using man coverage, which is the essential um, center of the package, if you will. How am I doing for time? Okay, good, almost done. Um, and what you're gonna do with this scheme is you're gonna, with five people rushing the quarterback that turns into a pass, or five people filling gaps, um, and five people mirroring the potential offensive receivers and potential running backs, you're going to end up with a lot of congestion wherever they try and mirror the football automatically. Because all you have to do them is tell them, mirror this guy. He's yours. You know, to the point where if he runs backwards, I would actually tell this guy to mirror that by running backwards as well. Just to maintain that mirror position on that guy. Um, that doesn't happen very often, and I might change my mind about that tactically, but you get the idea. He's yours. You're mirroring number one. If he's downfield, you're downfield with him. You're actually, as a second-level defender, you're actually, after you give him an, an initial bump, you're inside of him. You're actually letting him get vertical position on you as you tuck into his back pocket, because we want to prevent the laser beam. We want to prevent the fast, sharp, you know, horizontal throw from the quarterback out to one of these guys by, by inserting R in between the quarterback and number one as number one heads downfield. Now meanwhile, we've got the deep safety and if the quarterback decides he likes throwing to number one because he's beaten his man, he's gonna have to arc the ball over R to get it to number one in the first place. And he's gonna have to contend with this guy who as he sees the plays develop suddenly turns into a freight train with about 20 yards worth of momentum and it may be the case that number one catches the ball, but he'll regret it if he does. And that's the essential threat of the two level defense. Now, the beauty of it is, it's almost infinitely adaptable to circumstances, because that's not the only coverage you play. There are a potential 242 fronts that you can show with one two number combination. The two numbers tell your five first level defenders how to line up. And each one of them has a rule. It's a, it's a simple rule. It's an odd number, it's an even number, it's a two-digit num number, it's a one-digit number. Each of them has a different rule, but when you add all the rules together, you get 11, 13, 11, 13, 13 fronts. And then you get different places where the second level can stack in behind the first level defenders. And this is another thing for block protection. You're not just hanging the second level defenders out to dry. You're stacking them in behind the first level defenders automatically. By position. If they're mirroring, um, <clears throat> if you look at number 11 up here, which is a two digit call for what we would consider a 5 2 bulky look, if the Mike backer, if M, is mirroring number 3, who's a classic fullback back here, he stacks in behind M. That's the same thing in 33, where you bring it into a more of a TNT or an eagle look. If, if the fullback is here and he's number 3 and M is here, he will stack automatically behind. The nose man. And that gives him all kinds of block protection. And he's just mirroring that fullback. If he gets the ball, Mike's on him. If he doesn't, then different things can happen. But the basic threat is to account for everyone who could potentially get the football and meanwhile send five defensive linemen forward to attack. 
which is about as simple as it gets. Two basic coverages, again, man, where you mirror. That's your guy, that's your guy, that's your guy. They motion, you bump, and then you mirror. There's no brains involved. And again, the threat there is that since you were inserting yourself in between the quarterback and the receiver, they can't throw the laser. They can't beam the ball in hard and fast. They have to arc it over to get the ball at sort of medium depth to that receiver. They have to throw the little lob pass. Now, with the deep safety coming like the proverbial freight train once he reads that, and it's astonishing how easy it is to train the defensive uh, deep safety to read, you know, throwing the ball to the number one receiver out in space on the weak side. Um, you're just not going to see that happen too often after the first two or three collisions, um, people will start dropping footballs in Syria City. The other alternative is to run what looks pretty much like classic plain vanilla cover three. You take L and R, Len and Ron is what we call them, always to the left, always to the right, send them to the deep third, you send the deep safety up to the middle deep third, you drop three of the inside two level defenders, second level defenders, into what we define as three hook zones in the middle, and you rush five. Now here, we're taking away the medium depth pass, we're taking away the deep pass, we're inviting them to throw short, but we're also inviting them to throw into the teeth of the five-man rush. And you can alternate these. So if they're prepared for man coverage, and they're prepared to try and arc the ball over to medium depth, they're in trouble if you're covering medium depth with a zone. If they're prepared to throw short, they're in real trouble if you're playing the man coverage and you're inside their pocket. They're not going to complete too much of the short, quick stuff that way. And you alternate. You keep them guessing. Sir? What adjustments would you make if they came up with tricks? Would you still run that way? There are, glad we asked, with variations. Okay, tricks wide side, we will drop land to deep third again will bring the deep safety down to deep two-thirds. And because he lines up so deep, he can cover two-thirds of the field. He's got the ability tactically to do that because he's running forward the whole time. He can cover a lot more territory because of that simple fact. And now we adjust the zone drops, and now they're wide flat, wide hook, and middle hooks. And they sort of bump one zone over to adjust to the fact that we've got trips here that we're contending with now. We man the weak side single receiver. We lock Ron onto him. And then, because there's only one potential receiver left, and it's a back who may or may not be a great receiving threat, we take our defensive ends, who are sometimes given slight pass coverage uh, responsibilities, and we drop them into something we call short side square, which is not quite a zone. Because basically, it's him against him. And this is the turf that he has to cover. But if he releases to that, it's because he comes out as a pass receiver. If he stays in and blocks, he's rushing, and we've still got a five man rush. So it adapts itself using different variations, and there are a lot of them. The basic two is like vanilla chocolate, and now we get into, you know, um, strawberry, peppermint cream, or whatever. Um, there's as many variations as you need to make. But the thing is, we're showing by bumping, no matter what coverage we're using. They go in motion, we bump. That's true if we're running man, it's true if we're running zone, it's true if we're running this um, special coverage. We're still bumping. You'll notice we're bumping, okay? This person starts off as number one to this side. So all of a sudden, Ron locks in on the new number one, and he's manning him because we've got this coverage call. That means Sam is going to drop back off of his press position and allow himself to bump as well until he reaches Mike's position and he bumps Mike. I mean, literally, we say bump. You know, when we're teaching this, if Sam's coming along here, he's going to make sure Mike is aware of what's going on. He can't assume that he's seeing the motion man. So he will physically slap him on the shoulder pad and say bump. And then Mike looks for the guy in motion and he goes with him until he gets as far as Will. And he says bump. And this is not difficult to coach. It takes about five minutes in my experience. They get the idea real quick. We're always bumping, no matter what coverage we're in. What do we give the offense by bumping? We give them the same look on every single down. That is the defensive version of option A-type deception. 
We always do the same thing no matter what our intentions are after the snap. We give them nothing. And that, my friends, ambition. The journey of a thousand miles sometimes ends very, very badly. <laughs> Is the end of my presentation, but I would welcome questions that you have. If any of this makes sense. Sir. Why don't you just run a few <laughs> You know. Because I've had your PowerPoint from years ago. I know you're a I don't see the. I don't see what. The different PowerPoint from this is the one that shows it adaptations to the script. Yeah. I just think you're, you're training, there's so many different things those guys got to learn, you got to focus on all the different fronts. I know there's a system there, but if you run a three front stack and you slant, yeah, I think you can get the same. I teach each of those defensive linemen one, bias, one rule. No, I don't blame you. It's a great system. And it's a system, which is what I love about the three stack. I just think there's a lot to connect to it. This can do three stack. This it looks like it. My Swiss Army knife here can can do three stack, but it can do other things as well. It's like a hammer. It's it's a matter of philosophy, coach. I understand you completely. I've got very good friends who've been addicted to the three stack for years now, and I can't blame them. Especially as a youth system, it's easy to install, and you can make it as complex as you need it to be. And easy or complex, you can make it effective. Um, and I'm all for that. And it's a, you know the idea of a systematic approach to anything appeals to me, obviously. I, as I hope I've, I've indicated. Um, but yeah, it's not as good a three stack as the three stack. But I can make it a three stack. And I can do it with my same two digit rules. So it works for me. Anyone? You ready for lunch? Yes, please. On your ABC pickoff. Yes. You said you have like your, your, your B is your, your, your normal kick it deep kicker. Yes. It pulls out as backups. Role. You said you've got A and C as your onside kick. Do they not have a role in kick coverage? Yes, they do. They're normal kick coverage people. These are just people that you've got on the kickoff squad who you encourage to learn to run skill in their own time, essentially. I mean, you can show them during one of the first couple of practices, but then you tell them, if you get good at this without us having to teach you, you know, every practice for 45 minutes, then we're going to use your onside kick during the season. And they they go nuts. They love it. Thank you. Anyone? Bueller. Thank you very much.